So I'd like to talk about a very interesting LRC circuit. But now I actually am going to put in two inductors, a capacitor and a resistor, and just get a sense of what we might see as we put the circuit together. And you might ask, okay, well, with this kind of circuit, what would I look at? And it basically isn't particularly surprising that it's a pretty straightforward circuit. There aren't a whole lot of tricks other than, okay, let me just do KCL of V1 and V out. And if I do that, I get two different, two different results, one of which for KCL at V out here gives me this result. And you're thinking, okay, that works, and I get a V1 is related to V out. You can see something that's going to be sort of in the order of a time constant-ish, at least from, for a first order term. But again, we're going to put all this together. For the other term of V1, I'm going to get this particular equation, uh, which is really interesting. And often not surprising that you might have like double in inductors with a capacitor in the middle. Um, that's often an ideal kind of approach to get sort of higher order circuits. And so as a result, you look at this response and you go, okay, I can take this, I group the V out and V in on one side, group everything to V1 on that side, and I can then go, okay, so this gives me a second equation. Well, in the end, I want to kind of get V1 out of there, but I have V1 here, so I can start now taking and substituting that in, um, and substitute that in, and now start to see what happens. Move the V out term back to the other side, and lo and behold, I get that Vn is related to this whole term um, with a 1 over R times V out. And you think, okay, that's great. There's an R here, so these two are going to normalize. So then I can push the R through all the terms, through this term, goes out of this one, shows up in the L and that term as well. And you think, great, I've got a transfer function. And now we can ask questions about what does that look like. And of course, where I'm going to get the sort of L1, L2, C over R is sort of going to be setting my core time constant, but now it's third order. So with it being third order, I need to think about this being, you know, now the third order, I've got to be thinking, well, it's going to be something like tau cubed is what is going to be the base of it. And the nice thing is over here, this is going to end up being 1. So again, I know that my gain is 1, and I'm going to have a 1 on that side. So you're going, great. But let's take a look at it when I plug in some values. So let's plug in the values that we would have over here for R being 1 kilo ohm, the inductors being in the two values of millihenry, and the capacitance being um, a little under a nanofarad. Not particularly surprising discrete values you might be able to find. And in doing so, my tau here is going to be 0.16 microseconds. That's going to be resulting in a um, frequency response in a corner that's going to be sitting at uh, right around a megahertz. And in that situation, um, you go, okay, if I do that, then what does everything do to this normalized tau? Well, I'm going to get S cubed, tau cubed, squared. There's going to be a 2, a 2, and a 1, and you think, Oh, that's interesting. But with a little bit, little bit of sort of looking at this expression, you realize I actually can factor this. And I get an s tau plus 1, an s squared tau squared plus s squared s tau plus 1. And you think, oh, that's kind of cool. This, of course, means that I now have a first order term and a second order term here with a q equal to 1. So you kind of get the roots. We kind of can see what would happen with this response. And what's really interesting is that this then gives me what is typically considered a, uh, this is actually has a particular form. This is actually a Butterworth filter. It's a third order Butterworth filter. It's kind of cool that you get this particular response. Um, and what's nice about it is it's a structure that's very flat through here. In fact, you can argue that the phase that you get out of this, if I plot it linear frequency and linear phase is, is going to be pretty much constant. Linear phase is useful because it means it has constant delay. For those of you who've done a lot of DSP, you're probably very used to constant delays because you use this all the time. And there's certain places where that's beneficial in your modeling, beneficial in the circuits that you're building. So this is something you might see. And then it comes to this particular point at the, at the corner and then rolls off in a very nice, gentle way. Um, you also look at the phase response and you go, oh, okay, I can see the phase response. 45 degree point is pretty much where the phase turns out to be linear. And it has sort of almost a continuous roll from 45, 90, 130, 135, which is pretty much right at the center frequency as you would expect, and then rolls down to 207 degrees. So this turns out to be a very interesting circuit, uh, a very, and it turns out to be, it has a lot of richness to it for what is, you would expect, actually a pretty straightforward 
uh, looking circuit element, um, and yet it has this very, very rich and very useful built-in properties.